I hear the noon whistle here in Port Atkinson, which is my cue to say that this is Steve Larson with the Hortonarium and staff up here in Port Atkinson, Wisconsin. We welcome all of you uh, that are uh, with us. We have a great crew of you out there, according to our uh, uh, information, our feedback here. That's great. We uh, are very happy to have Rick Grant uh, from the Minor Institute with us today uh, as our uh, presenter. And we certainly appreciate the support of DuPont Pioneer uh, for the webinar today. And we always want to uh, thank and uh, uh, give credit to our co-host, Mike Hutchins down at the University of Illinois, <laughs> and also uh, Jim Baltz, his sidekick down there in the Animal Science Department, for their uh, cooperation and, uh, and uh, involvement with our, our series. So uh, with uh, that, Mike, Oh, one other thing uh, that I could mention, and it's new and I sometimes overlook it, but for those of you that are listening, you'll see uh, a handout option on the menu on the, probably the right-hand side of your computer, and you can click on the PDF there that would give you the PowerPoints. Uh, there are six or seven uh, pages of them, six uh, PowerPoints per page, it sounds like. And so that you could actually, if the printer's close by, you can print those out during the any time uh, during the webinar. And um, but the sooner you do it, the more apt you will be able to use them uh, to take notes with and uh, and look at them uh, uh, in hard copy and fo to follow along with us if you'd like to do that. So, with those comments, uh, Mike, I will turn it over to you, Mike Hutchins, for your introduction of the of our presenter. Well, Steve, thanks very much, and it's uh, my personal and professional uh, 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 feeling to welcome back Dr. Rick Grant to our program. Rick has been on our program uh, before and is a very popular uh, webinar speaker as far as that goes. Dr. Grant grew up on a dairy farm in uh, northern New York State, got his BS degree at uh, Cornell University, PhD from uh, Purdue University, and then spent uh, a bit of time being a postdoc at the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison Research Center from uh, 19 1990 to 2003, Rick was a professor and extension specialist at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, and then in February 2003, became president of the William H. Minor Agriculture Research Institution located in, in near Chasey, New York. So, Rick, we're very excited to have you back on a topic that's going to be very exciting to all of us, and that is looking at uh, milking ra uh, ration fiber for all it's worth. So, Dr. Rick Grant, we'll turn the program over to you. Well, thank you, Mike, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, I guess I need to click here first to engage it. All right, well, as Mike just said, the topic today really is making milk with fiber, I guess is how I boil it down in my mind. Before I jump in, though, I have to just mention this first title slide you're all looking at is just a beautiful aerial view of the Institute. And if you're ever in northern New York, for whatever reason, I sure would extend the invitation to have anybody come by and visit. And you can see off in the upper right hand corner you can see the uh, dairy barn where we do a lot of the research I'll be sharing with you today. So let's let's go ahead and we'll forge, we'll forge into the topic. We're talking about making milk with forage fiber or fiber in general. We know that especially in the last several years there's been any number of factors, nutritional, environmental, economic, that have really begun to encourage farmers to feed higher forage diets. But really whether we're looking at high forage diets or just simply better strategic use of what might be smaller amounts of forage, I really feel strongly that we are entering a new era, a new era in our ability to formulate diets and accurately predict the cow response to the fiber in the TMR. And I'm going to share some of what I think are some of the more important concepts along the lines of getting the most from your forage fiber throughout the next 40 minutes or so. Well, certainly we know that when cows consume high quality forage fiber, all these wonderful things happen that we see on this slide, right? You get more milk, milk components. There seems to be fewer health problems. They're just easier cows to manage, aren't they? You have greater cow longevity. And some work that was published a few years ago by Larry Chase at Cornell measured up to 30% greater income over feed cost in these herds, which really focus, fine-tuned focus on higher quality forage, which really for today's purposes means greater fiber digestibility. So how do we make this happen? Well, as we go along, again, this is hopefully a slide that everybody in the audience has seen before in some format, 
but it bears repeating as you start out on some of these, these forge quality type talks. The relationship between fiber digestibility in forages and greater intake and greater fat corrected or solids corrected milk is so consistent, it's something we need to keep in mind. And, and Michigan State work from a number of years ago would say that for every about every one percentage unit increase in NDF digestibility, as you see on this slide, you'd expect a little more dry matter intake and about half to six tenths of a pound per day more of fat corrected milk. Now more recently, the Minnesota research group has, has sort of honed in on those, those diets which just are high corn silage. In their case, they define that as greater than 40% corn silage in the diet dry matter. But at any rate, you see the same sort of trend, don't you? You see about a three tenths of a pound per day per cow increase in fat corrected milk, which is simply being driven by the greater increase in dry matter intake. So the relationship between digestibility of the fiber, intake and milk production is consistent. And that's where we begin our story today. But we can't stop there. We need to get a little more sophisticated and really think about with our high quality forage, how do individual cows respond? And this is really sort of coming in at, at, to the discussion of proper forage allocation, which isn't a new story, but there's parts of this which people still haven't really focused on, I think, to the extent that they need to. So we did a study, actually when I was still at Nebraska several years ago, where we looked at two different corn silage hybrids in a TMR, a high and a low NDF digestibility hybrid. There were about 10 percentage units difference, as I recall, in fiber digestibility. And we looked at overall dry matter intake, as you can see, increased by about a pound, a little bit over that, and milk production increased by about two pounds per day over all the cows when they were offered the higher, higher quality, higher NDF digestibility corn silage. But as we look at this, in the figure below here, we have on the x-axis energy corrected milk at the beginning of the trial. What were the cows producing the day we started the, the trial? Then on the y-axis, it's a little bit different way of presenting the data, but here in the middle we have zero. That would mean if a cow, her data point fell on this line, that would mean that she didn't respond. Metabolically, she didn't care whether it was high or low quality forage. And then, of course, if it's positive, that means she responded quite nicely to fiber digestibility, or it could be negative. As we look at this, of course, we see, no surprise, the high-producing cows, right earlier in lactation, respond phenomenally well to forages, in this case corn silage, with greater NDF digestibility. However, as we go to lower levels of milk production, cows further out in late lact into later lactation, you can see that a lot of them really didn't respond at all. They fell right along this the zero response line. But here's my take home for this slide today. Consider this blue line, all right? Some cows actually respond negatively when they are offered high quality silages or high quality forage later in lactation. And that's something that we don't often recognize, but at this point a number of studies have shown the same thing. When you offer your highly digestible NDF forages to cows that are later in lactation, best case scenario is you might be wasting your money because they don't respond. The truly worst case scenario is you might actually be inhibiting or reducing milk, milk production response versus where they would be normally if they were fed a lower quality forage. So that's something we really need to, to keep in mind. Allocation of forage by production level is one of the first key points if we want to really maximize the milk that we're getting from our forage fiber. Right? That's something maybe we can talk about during the question and answer session, but just quickly, the animals that are represented by this blue oval here, they're not taking the energy from the digestible fiber and putting it into the milk bucket. If you think about it, probably what they're doing is reconditioning. So you might have a herd where they're becoming overconditioned if you feed too high quality forage too late into lactation. So to make milk, we need to understand fiber digestibility. But my point here really is we also, in the last year or so, we've realized we need to think about indigestibility as well, right? Two sides of the same coin, I realize, but there's real nutritional value in thinking about what indigestibility can tell us. And I'll spend some time as we move into the talk focusing in on that. Of course, physical form is also critical to the cow. She's a ruminant. We think about particle size or physically effective fiber, the fragility of that fiber, and how it varies among different types of crops, right? How quickly does chewing during rumination break down the particles? That's very critical to the cow. I won't spend any time today really on that topic, 
but both physical and chemical attributes are going to be critical in assessing forage quality and again getting the most milk that you can out of each pound of forage because it's related to a number of things related to eating rumination rumen function but it comes down the bottom line here is efficiency for each pound of fat corrected or solids corrected milk how much dry matter did that cow need to consume we focus first on rumen efficiency because that leads right into the measured milk production efficiency which is the bottom line for our dairy farms right so I like to use the phrase putting NDF digestibility measurements to work for you right what do I mean by that well on a farm if you're taking the time to collect the samples and you or your nutritionist is sending these samples off and getting some measure of fiber digestibility what do you use it for are you and are you using it to the greatest advantage on the farm so the first thing I think of would be ranking your, your hybrids or your cultivars by fiber digestibility I hope everybody in the audience is doing that for hybrid selection or simply for benchmarking Do you have different lots of forage say the difference between cuttings or hybrids or years even so you can kind of predict ahead of time how are my cows going to respond when I move from bunk one to bunk two or bag one to bag two or whatever it might be certainly we talk about allocation of forages and that's crucial and I think that's something that seems so unsexy but we need to focus on it more in the future all right troubleshooting feeding problems of course and making sure we have accurate forage energy values when we're formulating diets or just deciding what group of cattle to feed a particular forage inventory to and, and you just here you just need to think about the digestibility of the NDF in a forage is going to be a major driver of that forage's energy content then finally and what I'll focus on a lot today is the use of different digestibility or indigestibility measures in our nutritional models as we formulate diets for dairy cattle so I guess this is starting right off the bat here but I'd like to have a poll question which really gets at in the audience today what do people do what are you routinely using your fiber digestibility measurements for on the farm or when you're in decision-making mode well, I guess the polls are open, and uh, it looks like it's the same listing, uh, Dr. Grant, that you had listed uh, earlier in your, in your points. So I'm kind of curious, uh, Steve. Uh, you got to you got to do some voting up uh, over there, hordes. Uh, what, what are you going to vote? I think probably uh, in our instance, I would say the ration formulation, the last option there, probably. I need to remind people they can they can check more than one, for sure. Wow. Oh. Oh, I see one or more. Yeah. No, you can't I, check I, them all. I tell you, if, if we see people checking these all, I'm going to be unhappy, I tell you, because that sounds like a Democratic <laughs> vote then. Uh, vote, vote for all of them. Vote early and often. That's what they say. Well, uh, yeah, well, let's see. I, uh, we're getting pretty close to uh, two-thirds of Voting. Yep, let's close the polls and uh, share them with uh, Dr. Grant and uh, what, what's your take? Any surprises there? Well, to me it's interesting, and again, maybe some people only voted one time, just checked one, but nonetheless, nearly 80% of the attendees right now are really focused on using digestibility or indigestibility numbers for ration formulation, which tells me a little bit, I'm guessing probably maybe we're top-heavy in terms of the audience today with nutritionists, which is fantastic. Um, although certainly farmers could be focused on this as well. Um, the other ones, well, I guess the next one would be adjusting energy values, which makes sense. That probably feeds right into ration formulation. I'm a little surprised that only about 13% said they use it to rank hybrids. I'm thinking particularly with the corn silage hybrids that are out there. NDFD is one of the major um, columns in all, all, of, all of the company's seed books, right? And certainly with alfalfas and other, other grasses, NDF digestibility has become very, very common to look at. So I'd hope if we did this a year from now or even maybe next week after the seminar, that 13% might go up a little bit. Okay. okay. So that as a backdrop, and it's good information for me to know as a presenter that uh, the vast majority are really interested in how we use fiber digestibility for ration formulation. Let's move into the next phase of the talk. I'm going to back up just a little bit with that preamble and, and talk about how or what should we be measuring with our to, to, to estimate or to measure forage digestibility and let's start out simply can we simply use still lignin or lignin as a fraction of NDF or it could be ADF 
how accurate, how useful is that today as we're trying to really feed our cows higher forage diets with some of our new hybrids? Well, there's no doubt, especially if you look on the right-hand side of the, of the figure here, or of the, of the slide, lignin, I like to call it a plant plastic, because really, if you look at its chemical composition, it is virtually indistinguishable from the polymer, which we call plastic. So certainly as a plant matures, or if it has a genetics which predispose it to lower fiber digestibility, for instance. If you look at this cartoon on the right, you're going to see more of these black boxes, which is simply the author's way of indicating lignified or heavily cross-linked lignin components of the cell wall. And as, as that is chewed and swallowed and digestion proceeds in the rumen, of course, lignin is going to exert a controlling effect on the rate and really what we say the extent, how much total fiber can be digested in the rumen, right? And that's what's indicated by this increased concentration of the black block, black <laughs> blocks over here as a tongue twister for me. Right? That's going to eventually stop fiber digesting bacteria from doing their job. So that's why people on the left hand side for many years, decades now, have looked at whether it's legumes, corn silage, or grass silages. They've said, okay, measure the lignin, look at the lignin to NDF ratio, and let's say for instance for alfalfa, that should not be above 15% for what we, what we would consider to be high quality high digestibility forages for our high producing cows, or less than 6% for corn silage and so forth. The real question is, can you just stop here with a lignin and NDF measurement? And unfortunately, we realize more and more, especially with some of the research in the last few years, that the answer is no. Lignin is surely related to digestibility and negatively, but particularly for our corn silage hybrids and a few other types of, of, of crop species, that relationship has a significant amount of variation, and that can really cause problems as illustrated in this next database. This to me is phenomenal, this slide. If we ask the question, do we need to actually go out there and measure NDF digestibility? Well, let's consider this for a moment. This is actually data that I extracted from a larger database by uh, Van Amberg's group at Cornell University. And what we have here are five lines. Each one of these lines represent five separate samples from different corn silage hybrids. And you can see that they all have virtually the same NDF, right, about 42.5%, and very similar lignin. So if we just stopped there and used our what we know about lignin and its negative effect on NDF digestion, we'd have to predict that all five of these different corn silages would have very, very similar digestibilities. And here I've got 30-hour NDFD, or if you're more familiar with the rates, percent per hour of fiber digestion, maybe look at that column. But what did Van Amberg's group actually see when they took these samples into the laboratory? Well, look at this. To me, this was eye-opening when I first saw this data set. Despite the fact that lignin to NDF was virtually the same, 30-hour NDFD varied from 42 up to almost 57 percent. If you think about that basic relationship between NDF digestibility and milk, from the Michigan State work some years ago, that could be a range of seven to eight pounds of milk, couldn't it? So I guess my point here is if we just rely on lignin or NDF, we run a real risk of making a horrible feeding decision relative to either assigning the right inventory to the right group of cows or simply formulating the right kind of diet, right? And you might ask, well, why is that? What we've learned in the last few years from research done around the world is that uh, lignin content in the crop is critical but even more importantly, even more important, is the degree to which that lignin is linked or bound or cross-linked with the carbohydrates in the cell wall, right? Cellulose and lignin, excuse me, cellulose and hemicellulose, basically. So the cross-linking is what's important. And cross-linking is really affected by genetics of the plant, maturity at harvest, and the growing conditions, which is something we all know. So it makes sense that we need to focus in on the digestibility I'm going to argue the indigestible fraction because it contains the lignin and we found that it's highly responsive to the growing conditions of the plant. So the bottom line, we can't rely on just lignin or NDF. We have to measure digestibility or some measure of fiber indigestibility if we want to make the most milk. So let's dive into that concept in a little more detail, but let's not dive in so deeply that we drown this afternoon. I'm going to kind of maintain a high level talk if people have questions, we can certainly address those at the end. So, indigestible fiber. Obviously, it's the opposite of digestibility. You probably didn't need to tune in today to figure that out. But it is the highly lignified, indigestible component of any crop, 
And here's the important part I've got highlighted in blue. The indigestible fiber and the amount of lignin in that, that ratio is highly variable. And as I said just a few moments ago, it is very responsive to the crop you've planted, the genetics you've purchased, when you've chosen to cut it, and most importantly, the growing conditions. Was it wet? Was it dry? Was it hot? Was it cool? We know all of these things affect digestibility, but it affects fiber digestibility by affecting this indigestible fiber and the amount of lignin. So if we can go to the lab and measure indigestible fiber, we should be light years down the road further in terms of our ability to predict the cow's response. And so that's really what we've been doing. Labs are measuring INDF now, but to make it fun, they're calling it undigested NDF. And there's a reason for that. Um, so we, we say UNDF, and I'm sure many people on the webinar today have heard of UNDF. Currently, the, the uh, measurement of UNDF that's most widely used in the field would be the 240-hour in vitro fermentation method to measure UNDF. So you'll say, or you'll hear UNDF 240 referred to at some of these talks or some of the papers you might read. And it's basically a so-called tillitary system. You take the sample, grind it up, you throw it into an artificial rumen, and you mimic what goes on in the rumen for 240 hours, and what's left is thought to be truly, functionally, an indigestible fiber residue, right? And the labs are reporting these values. And the next slide just gives you an example of what you might expect. And this, <clears throat> pardon me, I extracted from a recent newsletter from Dairy One Lab, but other labs are measuring the same thing. And as you look at this, let's, they, they've broken up for corn silage, legume, grass silage. And you can see there's an average, like let's take corn silage as an example. About 8.7% of the dry matter is UNDF at 240 hours. That's the undigested fraction, right, which is highly responsive to the growing conditions. But averages can get you in trouble, and look at the tremendous range in the samples they've analyzed, 2 to 25 percent. Let's just drop down to grass silage. It averages 15 percent UNDF, right? But look at the range from 2 to nearly 45 percent. Holy cow. Think about the problems you could run into if you're trying to formulate diets or make feeding management decisions based on an average number, and you're feeding something at either end of that distribution. To me, it drives home the importance of measuring undigested fiber, and the coin of the realm right now is UNDF 240, and it's this tremendous variation in UNDF that we have to capture going forward if we want to do the best job that we can of formulating diets and predicting the cow response. That's a key point in my mind. Another point, though, shift gears just a little bit. So we have UNDF at 240, the truly undigested fraction, but there's also fast and slow NDF that exists in all forest types. And this is some data from Mike Allen from a few years ago. Now I just want you to look at it. Don't get caught up in the mathematics or the exa exact numbers. But clearly I have, you know, three fermentation curves. Here's time from 0 to 48 hours of fermentation of the fiber. And here's the NDF digestibility for alfalfa, <clears throat> corn silage, and orchard grass. As you look at that, you see just visually there's clearly a fast fermenting fraction of the NDF and a slow fermenting, right? Whether you look at corn silage or grass, you see the same thing across all the forages that we feed to dairy cattle. There's clearly a fast and a slow rate of fiber. It's not one uniform fraction. <clears throat> and we've known that. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm not getting choked up. I have allergies. We've known that for a long time. But now we're finally at the point where we can put together a formulation approach which takes that into account. And we can do a much better job, we think, of modeling or basically reflecting the reality that the cow sees of fermentation in the rumen. So this is kind of a busy slide. I'm going to take a few minutes to go through it. But I think if you can grasp the concept in this slide, you should be good to go. The mathematics, if you need to know them, you can learn them. But you really don't need to know that to run most of the computer programs. So you see the term three-pool model. What does that mean? Well, the three pools or the three fractions of the fiber would be the indigestible NDF, which I've defined as UNDF, then the fast and the slow. Those are the three. And I've tried to draw these out graphically. This is the way I can appreciate it the best. So again, just like the previous slides, we have fermentation time on the x-axis. And here's the NDF remaining, all right? And I've just drawn slides, excuse me, curves for <clears throat> two representative forages. The blue line would be sort of a high fiber digestibility, a high quality forage. The red line would be 
a little lesser quality, not quite as high fiber digestibility. And if you take a look at the blue line, you might think maybe BMR, conventional corn silage, if you need something concrete to think about. As we look at this, you can see very, very fast initial rate, then it slows down, and this would be the slow pool. And similarly with, say, the conventional corn silage, if you want to think that way, right? Fast, then a slower, slower digesting pool of fiber. But you can see with the higher quality forage, much more fiber disappears, right? It's got a greater digestibility. And the time points that labs are looking at these days, again, this is based on some of the Cornell work, would be 0, 30, 120, and 240 hours. Okay, those are listed over here. And again, without worrying about the math or the modeling, just look at it. And you can see that, among other things, 0 and 30 hours probably aren't too bad in terms of two time points to give you a pretty robust way of measuring the rate of the fast digesting fiber. And similarly, 120 and 240 hours aren't too bad in terms of picking time points, which would give you a pretty good way to estimate the slow digesting fraction. And so it's a little more complicated than that, but basically that's why those numbers are in play. And certainly they're numbers that work well for forage labs. You just have to be practical about that. So labs are routinely measuring this now. I see forage lab results come back and they have a UNDF at 30, 120, and 240. And you'll see all of those. And you can use them all to calculate rates if you're formulating rations or just to, just to track the potential intake that you might expect from your forages, particularly from, say, UNDF 30 or even UNDF 240. The higher it is, the less they can eat. Right? So the bottom line is going forward in the next year or two, I'm so excited about how much better we're going to be able to characterize fiber in terms of its fast and slow fermenting NDF. And especially with high NDF or high forage diets, we're going to do a much better job of predicting accurately the intake and milk we expect from these cows fed these kind of diets. All right. But in a nutshell, I think the terminology we'll see going forward, if you talk about high fiber digestibility, high quality forage fiber, it's going to be associated with more fast NDF, less slow NDF, and less overall UNDF. In other words, less of that highly lignified indigestible component which is responsive to genetics and the growing conditions and so forth, right? So that's going to be ballast. From the cow standpoint, you're looking at ballast here. It's going to sit around the rumen until the digestible fiber disappears to the extent that it's going to. And it's going to sort of constrain total intake, right? It's going to fill up that rumen a little bit. And I really think, we don't know this yet, but going forward, people are doing studies where we'll be able to answer the question, what is the right ratio? the right amount of fast and slow NDF to optimize rumen efficiency and then milk production efficiency. So in a nutshell, that's where we're going, going very rapidly in terms of where our nutrition models are heading. And I'd say in the next couple of years, people who choose to can be totally immersed in this UNDF fast, slow NDF jargon or nomenclature in this model, and we'll be doing a very good job of formulating diets, I believe. All right. Also, we can talk about the range in undigested NDF in terms of just more practical on the farm monitoring. How much can that cow eat? And I need to say there's a huge caveat here that we're just still in the process of conducting trials here and elsewhere. So take this with a grain of salt. This is not chiseled in stone at this point, but is there a maximum in, let's say for UNDF 240, for high-performing cows? Cows that are eating a lot of feed, you're expecting 90 pounds or more of milk out of these cows, high components. The work that's been published to date would suggest that, well, it's a percent of body weight to make it even across cows, about 0.25 to maybe up to 0.45% of her body weight is how much undigested NDF measured at 240 hours that a high producing cow can eat. Below that range, maybe she might run into problems with rumen function due to inadequate rumen fiber content, right? Don't know. Don't know that for sure, but I would bet that might happen. Maybe more importantly for a lot of our rations, if you get above that range, you're really trying to push feed this maybe forage that's not quite as high quality as you'd like. That happens sometimes, at least in the Northeast. You could hit a rumen fill constraint. Much above 0.4, 0 0.45% of body weight. If you try to push more of that UNDF into her rumen, you can do it, but it's going to be at the expense of intake, right? Which means it'll be at the expense of milk production. And the last thing I'll say here is we, the work we've done to date, and it's not much yet, but it seems like the ratio of the UNDF that the rumen can hold and the UNDF in the diet doesn't vary very much, doesn't vary much. 
But 1.6 seems to be how trial after trial that we've done works out. So whatever the UNDF is in the TMR, that's going to be a basis of the forage quality, right? 1.6 times that amount seems to be what the rumen can hold. So if you go above that, it's going to start constraining intake, reducing intake, limiting intake, I should say. We need to learn a lot more about this, but this is why it's so terribly exciting because we're beginning to get thumb rules, which might help on the farm, and more detailed knowledge, which is going to help us design better formulation software to feed forage as effectively as we possibly can. The bottom line, though, for those of you who like pictures, and I certainly would be in that category, here's a cow. I'll say this is a New York cow. She's probably two. Her type isn't good enough to be out there in Wisconsin, maybe Illinois. Here's a rumen. Here she is at the beginning of a feeding cycle. She eats, she eats, and then throughout the day she ruminates, digestion proceeds, and the rumen empties, and this process repeats itself. So really, this is the best way I can think about it. This is what we're trying to do is, as accurately as we can, we want to predict what goes on over 24 hours in that cow's rumen, because then we can really accurately predict her milk production and her intake. So that's really where we're going with all of this. I'd like to pause for a moment take a drink of water and uh, open up another poll. And again, building on, on this whole concept of UNDF and fast and slow NDF, I want to get a feeling for you people listening, which of these lab measures of fiber digestibility do you routinely monitor? And again, you can select more than one, right? But it's just lignin, some benchmarking, say NDF at 24 or 48, or if you are making use of 30, 120, or 240 hours of UNDF, I'd be I'd be curious to see what the audience is doing today. Well, the polls are open, and we're off and running. Uh, Steve Lars, uh, you know, this multiple choice, I'm just afraid that uh, people are just going to check the bottom three. I, w I would have only left them vote one, but that's okay. Uh, where it's a Republican-type thing. Uh, Steve, uh, where are you going to vote? I think probably the, you know, to be honest, the NDF uh, digestibility at 24, 28, or 48, rather, is... Uh, the most typical thing uh, that we monitor at this stage of the game, but it sounds like things are going to change. Yeah, I'd vote for the 30-hour one that, that uh, because that's been so common. You know, the, that's the NDFD type formula we've had over 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 time. So anyway, we've got uh, almost 60% of the vote in, and uh, we don't want to take up too much of your precious time here, Rick. Let's uh, go ahead and close the poll at 60%. And uh, Dr. Grant, uh, any surprises here? No, not really. It's interesting, though, I'll tell you. So the, the first one, NDF digestibility at 24, 48, 64%. Well, I guess that's not too surprising. We think about uh, historically, especially over the last decade, we've really pushed benchmarking at 48 hours. That might be driving a lot of that 64%. Some might still be using a 24-hour. And then lignin or lignin to NDF, as I said, that's not certainly that's not horrible. I don't want people walking away feeling like they're a lesser person because they look at lignin. Um, I do think over time, as people measure indigestibility, straight up do that in the lab and get NIR predictions, we'll see less lignin in ADF or NDF measurements, but still, it's clearly related negatively to, to quality. And then we look at 30 hours, yeah, that's not surprising. And that, that's been a benchmark for a long time because people think that 30 hours relates to the average time spent for a particle in the in the rumen of a high producing cow and also maybe more recently in the last year or so uh, NDF, uh, UNDF at 30 hours has been uh, put out there as a, as a pretty good benchmark to compare forages in terms of their intake potential. I know Larry Jones has been doing that. And then fewer for the UNDF at 240 hours because that, that's certainly of all of these this is the newest wrinkle, right? But I think going forward it probably has as much to offer in terms of our ability to feed cows is anything in this list. So that's fantastic information. Um, that helps me again. So let's move on to the next component of the, uh, of the talk. I guess I need to click here. All right. So I'm going to shift gears just a little bit um, and say, let's, let's, so we've got forage quality. We've talked about how we can monitor it and how we can measure it on the farm. How much NDF can be consumed by the cow? And even more importantly, for my purposes this afternoon, how long does it take the cow to consume that forage or that NDF? Well, Dave Mertens has written extensively on this topic, certainly how much can she consume, goes back decades now. About 1.25% of her body weight is optimal. And of course, there's a range around that, depending on stage of lactation, age, and so forth. 
But that's the point where you can maximize milk production from the forage that's in the diet. It's not the maximum forage, because you can feed more forage, make her consume more NDF as a percent of body weight, and she'll just reduce milk production. But if you're trying to maximize milk, about 1.25% has been and probably still continues to be a pretty good benchmark. But my point today, if our focus is really on high quality forage, getting the most milk that we can out of our forages, we know from some of the BMR corn silage work, for example, that routinely, at least in our labs, we measure 1.5% or more a percent of body weight NDF intake with these highly fermentable corn silage type diets. Uh, with pasture, oh, no, look at that, that stuff is smoking hot. 1.8% has been reported. You know, so very high quality NDF, very low lignin, very high digestibility. The indigestible fraction is very, very small. So I think the bottom line here, and we can talk about grasses versus legumes a little bit later, we've really underestimated the intake potential of high quality forage NDF. Those cows can consume a lot more forage fiber than we've given them credit for, especially as we push for better genetics and, we, and our harvest management has improved over the years in the storage and the bunkers. We're routinely getting pretty high quality forage into our cows. So if we're thinking 1.25%, that may not be so true anymore. Maybe upping our scale more to 1.5, 1.4, 1.5 for our silage-based diets, maybe is not a bad way to go. But my main point for this afternoon, I feel duty-bound, since my, besides forage is my other hobby, I guess would be cow behavior, and I feel duty-bound to talk about the interaction of the forage that's in the TMR and the environment in which you offer that TMR to the cow. I'm just going to focus on one data set, but we know that as fiber content in the diet and the forage is increased, of course it takes the cow longer to eat that forage or that TMR. She has longer meal lengths. She can sort more, although I won't get into that topic today. And a tremendous amount of her energy, if you feed a cow pretty poor quality forage, 10% or more of her energy that she consumes can be just spent in chewing and processing the stuff. So you really don't want that to happen in your milk cows for sure. You want that energy going into the, into the bulk tank. But the key thing is, if fiber is higher, digestibility is lower, how much of a difference does it make in terms of time spent eating? And what is the significance of that relative to time allowed at the feed bunk, right? Feed bunk management. Now, this slide's a little bit busy, but I only want to make a few points. This is some work we did a couple of years ago here at the Institute. And our reason for doing this more focused on the rumen, but one of the more interesting outcomes was the behavioral data that we collected. So let me just orient you really quickly to the four columns here in this study. We had low forage in the diet, so you can see columns one and three, about 53, 49, so let's say about 50% forage diets. Then we had a higher forage diet, columns two and four, about 65% forage, if you can follow me on that. And then within each level of forage, we had primarily corn silage, it was either BMR or conventional. So let's take the low forage diets first of all, columns one and three. And you can see that in this case we had conventional corn silage CCS at about 40% or we had 36% BMR. Similarly with the high diets, conventional corn silage or BMR, we had about 54% corn silage and about 51% BMR. So the bottom line here is that we had about a 15 percentage unit spread in forage content, considering silage, corn silage of forage for the moment. And we had about a 6 percentage unit spread or difference in NDF digestibility as we look across here, right, between BMR and conventional. Now we looked at intake, we looked at performance, we looked at all those things, but there's only one point I want to make today and that's eating time, hours per day. So draw your attention to these, this blue line of data right here. Two points. If we look at the extremes, columns two and three, the high, highest forage diet with the lowest NDFD corn silage and the lowest forage diet with the BMR, there was a full hour per day, one hour per day difference in the time those cows had to be at the bunk eating. So translate that into the range of farms that you work with or that you have out in the industry. And does the farm truly have the capability or is a management system good enough to allow a cow an extra hour of eating time if she needed it as NDF digestibility or amount of forage in the diet varies. 
I don't know of too many farms that take that into account, but I think we should. Even the NDF digestibility itself, if we look within a level of fours, let's take columns one and three, the low, the 49-50% forage diets, there was about a half hour per day difference due to BMR or not. We saw the same effect with the 65% forage diets, if you see that, right? About a half hour per day. Again, are our cows being managed in a way that if, as we pull BMR in and out of a diet, maybe we don't even change the forage content, but we change the source of the, of the corn silage NDF. Does the cow and think maybe overcrowding, think maybe mixed uh, parity pens with, with uh, primiparis or first calf heifers in those pens, do they have that extra 30 minutes or an hour to access the feed? I don't want to belabor it, but I think this is an important point. All right? It's a time budget challenge. And it intersects so clearly with our discussion today of forage quality. All right. So I guess I do want to belabor it. I lied. This can be a quick poll. So I just want to know, what's the feed bunk stocking density for our high, high groups out there? And is this something we should be thinking about relative to the quality of the, of the fiber being fed? Well, the polls are open, and I tell you, uh, and there must be a bunch of Republicans because it's, it's a rapid vote coming in here. <laughs> Excuse me very quickly. Steve, uh, Hordes, uh, where's Hordes going to vote on this? Well, we're going to be 111 to 120. Okay. Oh, my. Interesting, interesting. And uh, we're getting pretty close to having 60% uh, of the vote in, and they're coming in pretty quickly. As Dr. Grant points out, it's going to be a, a speed vote the way it looks, and uh we are there. So let's go ahead and close the polls. And uh, Dr. Grant, uh, your impressions. I'd say it looks pretty good. I'm not going to belabor this because I see time's growing short, but about you know, a little, little over half, 100 to 110%. Uh, that's really very good. Um, I'd have to say, it seems like when I give talks around the country, I hear a lot of 120%, which I think is frankly too much. But fortunately, that that's you know the, the higher stocking densities. That's the minority of the, of the herds that we're talking about today. But it's certainly if you're in that 110 and above, 120 and above, really take to heart the last slide and the last concept I just shared. Okay, let me click here and forge ahead. My last topic in the last few minutes is just a little bit about grasses versus legumes. And this, is, this could be a topic onto its own. We know there's, there are major differences between legumes and grasses in terms of how they respond to chewing or processing on the farm. And the bottom line, I think for a lot of people, if you're trying to feed high quality grass, is the very bottom of this slide, right? You can reduce intake pretty quickly with the grass if it's not high quality. The NDF digestibility isn't there, right? You can do that with a legume too, of course, but it's even easier with the grass because of how they break into longer shards and just generally the characteristics of how they digest compared to legumes. And that's shown on this graph. If there's three or four really important graphs in my presentation today, this would be one of them. Because this captures everything you know, you need to know, I believe, about uh, grasses versus legumes. So if we take a look at this, we can see the, uh, the red line is alfalfa or typical legume, very rapid initial rate of digestion with time in the rumen, right? By contrast, most grasses are going to have a little slower rate. They come out of the gate a little bit slower, but then if they stay in the rumen long enough, they have quite an advantage over legumes because they're lower in lignin, they have more potentially digestible fiber, NDF. And so I always tell people when I'm talking about uh, harvest management, your goal should be to try to move this green line, the grass line, as far to the left as you possibly can, right? You can shift this to the left and intersect the legume line sooner. You can pretty much imagine that you can have more time where the grass line is above the legume line. What that means is if you're, especially if you're feeding high producing cows, that's when you can really leverage that grass. You can take advantage of its, of its higher potential extent of digestion, right? But if it doesn't stay in the rumen long enough, it's not going to matter. If you have really poor quality grass and it starts out really slow, it's a dog, and it crosses out here somewhere, well, the average mean retention time in the rumen is only 30 to 40 hours. So on average, you've pretty much squandered the value of your, of your grass. So cut it early spend the money to get the high quality grass cultivars that are out there and really maximize this this portion of the graph the difference between the red and the green lines between the grass and legume okay and just to give you some numbers real quickly this is some data I extracted from uh, dairy one a few years ago actually I think this is now and you have alfalfa 
Okay, we have grass. You can see the mean. So here's my pointer, right? For NDF lignin and 30-hour NDFD, there's the average. Here's the range that they were measuring across many samples in that lab. Here's grass, you know, sort of the average again, and then the normal range. So as you think about it, obviously from a, from a management standpoint, we're trying to shoot for the high end, whether it's alfalfa or grass, but particularly for the grass, we're, we've really got to shoot for the 70% or as close as we can get in terms of 30-hour NDFD, right, to stand a chance of successfully feeding grass to our, to our high-producing cows. And it goes back to that previous slide. You want to maximize the time that that greater extent, that native inherent characteristic of grasses, maximize the time that that's going to be operational or functional in the rumen, right? So shoot for high quality, shoot for high NDFD, and then of course feed the rest of the diet appropriately so that the animal can extract as much energy as possible from the fiber in that grass, all right? So I'm gonna end here, just in one, one or two more minutes. Um, this is very peripheral to today's talk, but I'd like to end with just something visual. I say food for thought, something to ruminate on later today. My question is, have we undervalued the role of rumen fiber digestion in, in the filling component of the diet, how quickly it turns over intake and milk production? So I've got two slides, two pictures here. If this is just basically the corn silage. The next slide is hay crop silage. And on the left panel, you can see it's just the silage itself, zero hours. On the other side is after 47 hours of having that same sample dropped in a nylon bag and put into the rumen of a cow. No ruminations occurred, no chewing. It's just sat there and it's fermented. And just notice the effect of digestion on this right panel. Look at how it teased apart those fibers are. And as you look at that, let me, let me flip ahead to hay crop silage. Isn't that incredible how these strands of fiber just come apart just due to the fermentation process? No chewing. But I think as we go down the road in the next few years, we're going to be amazed at how much we've really underappreciated the role that digestion and digestibility plays, not only in energy value of the feed, but how quickly it breaks down when it's ruminated and how quickly it passes out of the rumen, thereby allowing greater intake. And that's just a little bit of food for thought, but I like, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. And to me, this, this picture, especially with hay crop silage, just amazes me. It's like a rope that's been frayed apart. And you can just imagine that those cows are going to be able to eat more of that the greater the extent of the fraying, which means the greater the extent or the higher the digestibility of the forage. Okay, so in conclusion, if we're talking about milking, ration, fiber for all it's worth, allocation, think about individual cow responsiveness. Feed the forage to the right cow. Sounds simple, but it's a first step. Going down the road, I think we're going to look at fiber digestibility or indigestibility even more than we have. Lignin will remain important, but probably not as important, right? We are in the process of developing guidelines for fast NDF, slow NDF, and UNDF. We're looking at it across the lactation as well as the dry period. We don't have quite enough of that data yet to really get into the weeds, but that'll be coming in the next year or so. I am pretty convinced, though, it's going to fit the biology better and allow us to do a better job of accurate ration formulation. And as I just mentioned, we need to really leverage the intake potential, particularly of our grasses, which means cutting them early, and, and, and legumes as well. So the bottom line, I guess I'm an optimist, but I think we're really close to being able to better model the effects of rumen fiber digestibility as well as indigestibility. For those nutritionists in the audience uh, who use so-called Cornell model, CNCPS as it's abbreviated, the next version coming out probably in the next year or two is going to have this fully implemented, the UNDF and fast and slow. And I expect other nutrition models will as well. For me, it's, it's an exciting time, to say the least, to be feeding forages to dairy cows with all the new information coming down the pike. I would end by just saying stay tuned. There's nothing more exciting than uh, figuring out ways to feed more forages to a dairy cow, which is a ruminant. So with that, uh, Mike, I'll stop and I guess turn it over to you. Okay, you may want to push your next uh, two slides up there. Uh, and uh, Steve, we'll turn it back to you. Okay, Mike. Well, uh, Rick, thank you very much. Uh, wonderful uh, presentation. <laughs> Lots of really interesting things. I have to agree with you. It's an interesting time to be feeding fiber to uh, to our dairy cows, uh, and uh, interesting to think about how some of the old guidelines and thumb rules uh, we're going to be refining and changing a lot as we as we uh, look forward. Very interesting. We want to thank uh, DuPont Pioneer for their support of the sponsorship of today's webinar. 
And uh, as always, uh, thank you to Dr. Mike Hutchins and uh, Jim Boltz and the University of Illinois uh, for their uh, assistance, and uh, we appreciate that very much. Just a note, uh, the, those of you who have been with us today, we appreciate your attendance very much, and we would appreciate it when you receive a, a very brief survey here in a couple of days by email uh, that you respond to that to help us stay, uh, keep our webinar series on, uh, on, on focus and meet your needs. That's the important thing to us. Also, uh, a reminder, many of you already know, but uh, to any that are new, the, the, of course, this webinar, and all of our previous webinars are available. They are archived uh, uh, and uh, available anytime to, to anyone with internet access. Just go to hordes.com and click on the webinar uh, section of our website or web page, home page, and you can uh, find them all there. And uh, we're getting uh, probably 40 to 50 visitors a day or downloads a day from those archives. It's a very good. Uh, response and a, and a good resource, we think, for people. Let's look ahead. Uh, September 14th, our next webinar, Using Drugs Responsibly on Dairy Farms, Pam Ruig, um, always a popular presenter from the University of Wisconsin, and uh, Neogen Corporation is going to be the sponsor of that time. And then looking a little bit further ahead, Mike Hutchins uh, will be taking a, a look at the crop and feed outlook at that point in time. We'll know more about our corn and beans and what the forage uh, uh, situation will be and uh, so he'll be making that presentation uh, for us on October 12th and Zinpro Performance Minerals is going to be the sponsor of that uh, webinar. Uh, with that, Mike, are there some questions out there? We have a few minutes uh, left. Yes, there are. And so uh, get your speed hat on here, Dr. Grant, uh, off and running. We'll start right with politically the hot question. It looks like a Trump question. Should we use more legumes or more grasses for high-yielding cows? Oh, my goodness. Uh, can I pass? No, I'm just kidding. I think, well, obviously there's, there's a role for both. Um, we, we have great success here with our own herd feeding high-quality grasses. Um, if you think back to that one slide I showed toward the end, the key is picking out the right cultivar, but even more importantly is harvesting it early so that you stand a, a better chance of having that, that slower rate, which you're not, it's always going to be slower than the legume probably, equally high quality, but get it to cross over as, high, as quickly as you can and, and uh, take advantage of the intrinsically greater extent of digestion of those grasses. You, we, we often give grasses a wrap because it, we say they limit intake, but it's because we haven't fed very high quality grass. I think that's the key point, Mike. Another question on fragility. Uh, what are we at? Are labs going to be able to pre uh, measure this uh, routinely in the future, uh, the word fragility, and maybe you want to redefine that, uh, Rick? I can define it. Uh, I do know just from talking to some of the people who run the various forage, forage labs around the country that there's certainly interest in that. Um, certainly nobody's measuring it right now that I'm aware of. Um, but basically when I use the word fragility, we're talking about, you know, at a given particle size, how quickly does that forage break down in the rumen, you know, by chewing either during eating or rumination. So in the lab, you'd probably subject it to some sort of a standardized uh, grinding method maybe, for instance. And how quickly does a given forage source, NDF and digestibility source, break down? And so you, you could imagine that becoming somewhat of a routine measurement. It would take some doing, um, but then if you have the number, we need to really think about how we're going to use it to, maybe quantitatively in terms of ration formulation. Right now, it would pre pretty much just be a way to additionally rank a forage. You know, forages of similar NDF content and maybe even digestibility might have somewhat differing fragilities. And knowing that would be useful because it would be highly related to intake. Rick, uh, one uh, listener noticed that you made, made, made the term on UNDF that it's ground up uh, before being analyzed. Uh, w wouldn't that have an impact on the value depending on, on the grinding of the, uh, of the forage? Well, sure. In the rumen, it's, and, and I, I apologize, in 45 minutes I felt like I either had to focus on digestibility or the physical attributes of the, of the diet. But I think what the question is getting at is, sure, you could have a, a forage with a given level of UNDF, and if it's in its native state, whatever the particle size might be, or if it's ground, sure, you'd expect quite different uh, effects in the rumen, for sure. Um, but in terms of the lab question, though, 
you, you, need, you need to, to dry and grind a sample in order to get an accurate uh, extraction and get a decent NIR prediction, right? And so I don't think that's a problem. You, you want to grind it for the lab so you get an accurate number, right? You minimize your lab variation due to maybe too coarse a particle size. But for sure in the room, and particle size is going to be a key component of how the cow responds. What are your thoughts on shredlage silage and how it affects digestibility? Well, I, I guess all I know about is what I've heard Randy and others speak about it, and it does... It, it, I think its primary effect, from what I've been able to see, is, is more of a starch effect, right, in terms of increasing starch digestibility. There may be a modest impact from what I've seen on shredlage versus, say, just straight up kernel processing or just chopping in terms of improving NDF digestibility, but I think it's rather small. But there could still be potential there, coming back to the fragility concept. We've seen in our own shop where we've used other types of forages, say straw, for instance, and you've either chopped it or used a mill that kind of like hammers it and shreds it diagonally, maybe more like a like shredless, so, so the stem is opened right up. We do see greater digestibility then and a trend toward a little bit uh, more fragility, less rumination per unit of NDF. So the data I've seen so far would indicate that shredlage probably doesn't have a big impact, but I don't know what it's going to evolve to in the future. How's that for a, a weaselly answer? Well, it sounds like a very Republican uh, type answer. Definitely not a Donald Trump answer. Anyway, moving on. Um, mm -hmm. You you use the term <laughs> uh, 1.6 times UNDF. Uh, what about Holsteins and Jerseys? Do do you think there's some variation uh, in terms of where those numbers would be? Uh, looking at the size and and metabolism of those cows. Well, there could easily be, and I, I want to reiterate here, really really reemphasize. That that number, I'm throwing that out there just for people who are really interested. Um, I would not take that to the bank right now. Um, if, if, you're, if you're actively formulating diets and you're curious about, um, well, you know, am I in the right ballpark? For sure, use it that way. But, um, yeah, I might expect the jerseys, but they might vary by breed. It probably might vary by stage of lactation even, right? Dry versus uh, high producing. Um, of all the data I shared, that 1.60, that whole slide, basically 0.25 to 0.45 percent of body weight is UNDF intake. Uh, treat it as just a, a rough benchmark at this point. In another year or two, as the data comes in from our feeding studies, we'll know a lot more about that. Well, let's be kind to you and give you a little easier question. How long does the feed yeah. stay in the rumen is his first part of the question. Then uh, is there a range in that time? And then his last comment, probably more of a comment than a question, he always assumed or she always assumed that a hot hay uh, high quality hay shoots right through the cows and uh, does that have an impact on uh, fast passage versus NDFD? Do you want me to break those into three questions? Sure. So I think, I think the first part was what's the typical time that I assume let's say forage NDF would stay in the yep. rumen? Yep. Well if I had time I actually actually hit a slide which would have answered that question but basically we've done a lot of work and uh, also at Cornell and, and a few other places together looking at fiber where we've marked forage NDF from different, say, corn silage versus hay crop, and we've sieved it in, into large, medium, and small particles. And what I can say, this, the quick answer is the average sized forage particle, particularly hay crop and corn silage, its mean time spent in the rumen is about 30 to 40 hours. So that's answer one, right? So probably pretty much what we've always expected, maybe a little bit longer than we would have predicted from some of the older data. All right. Now, refresh my memory. Questions two and three. Yeah. Uh, the, the next part of that question, he, uh, the, he assumed that uh, hot, meaning probably high quality hay, shoots right through the mm -hmm. cows. And is, mm -hmm. uh, is, is that related uh, rate of passage going to have an impact on NDFD? Yeah. So I'll, I'll answer that question in the context of, of the new terminology I was trying to introduce, the UNDF at 240 and the fast and slow NDF. Basically, when we have a, a hot forage as we would call it, or a ration that's hot because of that. When you feed it, there's going to be less UNDF, so you might be riding that range on the low side, right? So maybe the rumen mat, some of the other things which, which sort of modulate how fast particles move out, the selective retention we call it. Um, that's maybe not as well formed as you might like to see, right? That's point one, so the ballast is less, right? So the cows can eat more, but what's going on there is, is they probably have a huge fast pool, so-called. The NDF that ferments fast, more rapidly, is large compared to the slow pool. 
And so you have that fiber being turned over very quickly. It's probably more fragile. So as, as rumination occurs, it breaks down more quickly. So you can picture a smaller amount of ballast in that rumen, and the forage is just fluxing through that rumen so much faster. In fact, I think with our really hot forages where maybe you have too much fast NDF, they're sort of out of sync. Um, that's where you lose efficiency. Cows are eating more, but the feed is passing through the rumen maybe so quickly that we actually lose a little bit in terms of digestion. Okay, let's go back to one of the very early questions that came in early in the presentation. What is the difference between UNDF and INDF? Are they the same? Uh, what do you think? Okay, well, <clears throat> they're not, excuse me. <clears throat> I promised myself, Mike, I wouldn't get all choked up over this today, but uh, <clears throat> I seem to be. Um, also, it could be allergies. Well, no, so they, they are different from a nutritional standpoint. Just as you might use the two terms just to, you know, on the street, maybe they don't seem very terribly different, but indigestible NDF is, is more a function of the, of the model that you're, used, that you're using. And I don't want to get into the, the mathematics of that, but indigestible NDF is, is more of a, a conceptual number. In other words, if you could ferment a forage to infinite time, <clears throat> that's what indigestible NDF would be. And of course, we never ferment forages to infinite time in any lab, so we have to define it and to, to kind of make it as clear as possible, we just returned it undigested NDF. Actually, Dave Mertens came up with that about two years ago. So we say undigested NDF because it's fiber, which is undigested at a given time point. In this case, 240 hours. And it's our lab measure of what is truly indigestible. Does that make sense? Yep, it sure does. The so UNDF is a lab measure and it should be linked to a time point, 240 or 30 or whatever. And, it's our, and if it's 240, it's a long time, we're trying to estimate in the lab the true indigestibility. It is not related to the one, is, is the INDF a 120 hour test or is that, is that not true? <clears throat> it's, well, maybe someone's defined it that way, but the way we used it, to, or the way I used it in this uh, seminar and going forward, INDF would be more of a concept, right? Every forage has a true indigestible, indigestible NDF if you could only measure it, but it would take infinite time because there's always a little bit more and a little bit more that could ferment most likely. And so you pick a time, say 240 hours, or in the past people used 120, now it's 240, um, and that's your measurement of undigested NDF at 240, which is our estimate of indigestibility. I guess that's the best way to think about it. Another quick related question came in with something like fuzzy cottonseed. Obviously, that's not a forage. Uh, are we looking at total UNDF from all feed sources or just forages? Comments? Yeah, well, right up to this point, it's been mostly focused on forage NDF, but that's a great question because depending on the year, you know, quite a bit of the um, NDF in the diet can come from non-forage fiber sources, of course. And right now, there's a project that's just finished at Cornell, one of Mike Van Amberg's students is looking at the question of how does the rumen, how does the cow respond if you have UNDF from forage versus UNDF from byproduct feeds. It's really fascinating stuff and I haven't seen the, the data on that so I can't tell you how the cow responds but I do know that if you send in a byproduct feed into a lab they're just getting on board with this. Um, the numbers, the, the time points are different. So you, I said you ferment a forage NDF at zero 30, 120, and 240 hours to get the fast and slow. Since byproducts tend to ferment overall much more rapidly than most forages, the recommended numbers for that would be, besides the zero, would be a 12 hour, 72 hour, and 120 hour. But it's the same concept, it's just that the time course is much more rapid with our byproduct feeds. Well, we'll take two more questions here. Uh, believe it or not, Rick, uh, the questions are coming in faster than you can answer them. Uh, do you believe NIR estimates for NDFDs and UNDFs? Sure. I can think of one good answer for that one. The labs that we routinely work with, which would be all of the major forge testing labs, um, I feel very confident. Uh, we, we make use of NIR predictions for NDF digestibility or increasingly now for the UNDF. Right. Of course, we all know it comes back to the quality of the calibration and so forth, but uh, the numbers we've seen, I think, are pretty accurate. Okay, the, the last one is, is a bit related to your graph that shows grass needing to stay in the room and longer to get good digestibility. 
How does that fit in with pasture when you get these uh, pastures that are, you know, that are extremely high, the New Zealand type forages, you know, that are 30 plus percent proteins and, you know, extremely high quality NDFDs. Uh, in other words, those grasses may be kicked out of the digestive tract quicker. Any thoughts on that in terms of on, on our pasture scenario? Oh, I think that's exactly right. I mean, if you, you can get too high a quality and probably uh, highly vegetative pastures as good a model for that as anything, right? Because I've seen lots of cows that are grazing and actually they're almost showing symptoms of acidosis. Certainly they're showing symptoms of, of not having a, a well-functioning rumen, right? They're loose. And you see a lot of fiber coming through in the feces. Um, so yeah, you can, you can, if that's the only source of, of uh, forage fiber, it can be too hot. It can have too little undigested fiber. It can have too much fast pool fiber. I mean, but that's the problem that we've known forever. Now I'm just using new terminology to describe what we've known, known why with really high quality vegetative uh, pastures, sometimes the easiest way to uh, get the cows turned around is to give them a little bit of free choice access to a decent quality round bale or something. Hate to throw that in there at the end of, of a sophisticated talk. I hope. <laughs> well, I lied. Here's, it comes here, throughout throw a round bale. <laughs> here, here's another but, question but that, that I find intriguing, yeah. and, it, and it just came in. Is there any sense in the UNDF 240 if the forage NDF remains only 40 hours in the rumen? So I guess he or she is struggling with the, the, your your 40 hour residence time, then mm -hmm. using a UNDF 240. Um, and that's a yeah, that's a common question, Mike. And here's, I think I was probably going too fast to make this clear, but the reason why UNDF 240 is important, of course, it has very little meaning, if any, to the rumen, right? At least for a high-producing dairy cow, because I already said that the average time is 30 to 40 hours of, of, of turnover, right? So that's not why it's important. Why it's important is, as an analysis of the forage, if you get a, a measurement of the truly indigestible fraction, that's important because that will tell you a little bit about the filling effect of the diet, right? You also need an endpoint to calculate rates, which I didn't talk about today, but that's part of it. But the key thing is the UNDF, the indigestible fraction, is highly lignified, and that fraction, as you measure it, varies tremendously across forages, and it's a function of the genetics, the maturity, and the growing environment. So measuring that tells us a lot about the digestibility we can expect and the performance we can expect from that forage. As a number, 240 hours means nothing to the rumen per se because particles don't stay in the rumen that long. Well, does that make a little more sense? Do you yeah, think? great answer. A very, very, I think, very helpful just to reinforce that, uh, Rick. Uh, a great job. Uh, uh, we're going to stop here because we'll have you out of voice here if we don't stop here. Uh, Steve, I'll turn it back to you to wrap it up. Okay, Mike. Uh, thank you very much. And again, thank you, uh, Rick, uh, Dr. Rick Rand, for a wonderful uh, presentation today and, and a very nice job with the questions as well. Uh, we had a great audience of people with us today. And in fact, even uh, still, we've had uh, a good lecture hall size uh, group of people with us to uh, get your comments through the question period and so forth, which speaks well for you and the, and the topic. So thank you again. Uh, very much for your uh, great job and also DuPont Bot Pioneer for their involvement. September 14, looking ahead, using drugs responsibly on dairy farms, Pam Ruig, University of Wisconsin, and then our co-host, Dr. Mike Hutchins down at the University of Illinois on the Crop and Feed Outlook on October 12th. So we hope to have you with us uh, again. And that's all from Port Atkinson, signing off up here, Steve Larson. <laughs>